My name is Daryl Press. I think I know most, most people out there, but my name is Daryl Press. I'm the coordinator of the Dickey Center's War and Peace Studies Program. And on behalf of uh, our director, the Dickey Center's director, Ambassador Ken Yalowitz, and myself, um, welcome to the fourth event in our year-long lecture series on the rise of China. And as I was taking notes on this, I was thinking back on the other, on the other talks that we've had. And again, I, I recognize many of your faces. I think many of you have been there. And we've really come quite a long distance already. So in the fall term, we had uh, Professor John Mearsheimer out who gave the um, rather controversial talk, which I, I think you could summarize by saying, um, if China acts half as aggressively um, and selfishly as the United States already acts, boy, are we in a lot of trouble. I think that's. <laughs> That's John Mearsheimer's view of this. And then this term, the, the purpose was to have three talks that actually focused on what's going on today in China. So we had Ed Steinfeld of MIT who came out and talked about China's economic growth. And I think his argument in a nutshell was for a variety of reasons, um, things are likely to look better in US-China relations in the future than what, what Professor Mearsheimer suggested, China might not be growing at quite the brisk pace that people project, number one. And number two, that China's really bought into this global economic system that we've constructed. And in many ways, that's going to constrain them and, and mitigate what might, might otherwise be a conflictual relationship. So we had a more optimistic view. Then we had uh, Min Jin Pei from the Carnegie Endowment. And he focused on the relationship between China's economic reforms, that I think many of us are aware of to their domestic progress, and specifically their democratization and the, and the stability in the regime in terms of the Chinese Communist Party holding power. And he basically argued that for a variety of reasons, he didn't think that China's rapid economic growth, even if it is, continues to be very rapid, will create the sorts of strains on the Chinese governing party and the Chinese Communist Party that many people presume. And so one of the takeaways from Min Jinpei's talk is, if your hope about US-China relations in the future stems from the notion that they're liberalizing economically, and hence they're likely to liberalize politically, and will pretty soon be facing a democratic China. Don't count your chickens before they hatch, that for a variety of reasons that we'll probably be dealing with the CCP for many years to come. Today we're going to have Ralph Thaxton, who is going to talk about instability and protest in China, and I'll say more about that in a second. But so these are three talks about what's going on in China today. And then the last set of talks will be in the spring term, and we're going to have a talk on China's foreign policy, and then we're going to finish this off with a panel event on US foreign policy alternatives. Are there different approaches that we might consider, given everything that's come before in this year-long pro program about how we should deal with China? So that's kind of the, the broad scope of, of what we're doing this term. Um, today, we're very, very fortunate to have Ralph Thaxton um, talk with us. We're doubly lucky, lucky actually. Um, number one, he's a world-renowned expert on China. And so that's wonderful. And number two, is unlike the other speakers, he's not somebody who's coming in for a day and a half and then taking off. Um, Ralph is a year-long in-resident fellow here at the Dickey Center, which means that he has an office, I guess, four floors up from here on the third floor of Haldeman. And he's a resource for all of you. He's a resource for all the students here at Dartmouth in particular. And if you have interest in China and questions about China and questions about his talk, you can either bang on his door or you can send him an email. But he's here really for all of us this entire year. So it's really fortunate to have him. Um, Ralph Thaxton is a professor at Brandeis University. For many years, he was chairman of the East Asian Studies Program at Brandeis. And he's a research associate at Harvard's Fairbank Center for East Asian Research. He's the, the author of numerous, I stopped counting, numerous articles. Um, most of which about China, as well as three books that I know of. There might have been more, but I, I know of three books, and including the very well-received um, recent um, Catastrophe and Contention in Rural China, a 2008 publication by Cambridge University Press, which I'm holding up now, and you could buy from Amazon as I'm speaking. Um, but as many of you know, um, China's a, a tumultuous place. That it's a place where, while it's growing economically, while it's um, advancing by leaps and, and, and bounds, it's also the location of an awful lot of protest. And I've, you've heard numbers, maybe I've heard them from Ralph, about how many protests there are in rural China each day or each, each, each year. And they're kind of staggering numbers. Today, Ralph's going to um, talk about the sources of these protests, um, the issues that bring so many Chinese citizens out into the street in protest, and the implications of those protests for China's political stability. So I'm really looking forward to this talk. And I hope you'll join me in welcoming uh, Professor Ralph Thaxton. I want to thank uh, Kenneth Yalowitz and uh, Christiane Walforth and Daryl Press for bringing me to the center of this wonderful environment of Dartmouth this year. Um, 
it's already been a great experience. Um, being at Dartmouth reminds me of my days as a graduate student at Wisconsin when I walked across the campus in these balmy 40 below uh, <laughs> temperatures. <laughs> so it, uh, it's brought back uh, fond memories. Um, I want to uh, warn you that I'm going to go rather fast today so I can get through a lot of material uh, and so that we can have a far-ranging discussion uh, on, on the topic at hand. And, and um, I'm going to take you through a number of themes that have to do with uh, protest and instability in contemporary China. Um, and what I want to start off with is um, the established wisdom of the China field, uh, which holds this basically China is a relatively stable authoritarian regime with um, a situation um, that has improved uh, enormously over the years. Um, and with little likelihood of uh, rebellion uh, and revolution in the future. Uh, what that interpretation often leaves out is that China also has an enduring rural legitimacy crisis. Uh, and it seems that most um, of the scholars who study China have concluded that the communist leadership is very adaptive and creative um, and that this particular brand of authoritarianism that it has is resilient. And, I think that Min Xinpei made this point very well when he spoke here, so that we see that China's rise is inevitable, and few can deny that in the past 30 years, uh, the changes that have come to China have been both mind-boggling and progressive. Hardly anything uh, could have been worse than happened uh, under Mao. I expect that there is a reasonably good chance that China is going to continue to rise, uh, and the chances of the central government becoming destabilized to the point where it loses power are minimal at least for the short term. Nonetheless, what I want to do today is step back in the face of various uh, international, uh, and inter inter international and internal challenges and point out some of the factors that could produce uh, spiraling contention and unmanageable domestic challenges to the center. So I'm going to frame China's current political dilemma a little differently than has been the case for the previous three speakers. First of all, I want to acquaint you <clears throat> with some little known and often understated aspects of politics in contemporary post-1949 China. And so what I want to do is give you a framework for grasping how people in the rural interior see the issue of political legitimacy and also how Beijing's leaders experience the challenge from the hinterland, which is wh where 800,000 people still live. In doing this, I want to ask you to keep two things in mind. First of all, rural people in China have always played a critical role in determining the fate of imperial power. And most Western social scientists who go to China and study China interact with urban state-based intellectuals in the course of attempting to grasp what is going on in China and how stable it is. But without what Clifford Geertz calls refined local knowledge of any given agrarian society, we're very much at risk in estimating just how stable the state that sits on top of that society is. In any event, rural people will have a say in whether the Communist Party can continue in power, locally and nationally. Secondly, widespread protests and contention have always signaled that the ruling house is in trouble with rural people. And throughout Chinese history, rural dwellers have voted with their feet. So much is this the case that all of the major regime changes, including the transition from the Guomindang to the Communist Party, have been violent. And one must keep in mind, too, that the Communist Party has not created any institutional arrangements to allow a peaceful transition from its modality of rule to alternative forms of governance. So we should not be surprised if, when backed into a corner, China's country people once again move to take matters into their own hands and challenge the ruling single party system from below, perhaps through rebellion from below. Most likely, this will not happen <clears throat> because the current leadership has managed to contain this legitimacy crisis that it has in the countryside. But let's look more closely at the crisis. So I want to talk for a moment about the violent and traumatic backdrop of contemporary protest and contention. OK, let's start with the major political experience shaping how China's rural people see the Lenin estate. Remember that China has suffered three major political traumas in the post-1949 period since the communists came to power, the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, and Tiananmen. 
If you're from the countryside, the one that is the traumatic experience in terms of harm, suffering, and loss inflicted is the Great Leap. <clears throat> the others pale by comparison. Mao's Great Leap Forward induced the worst famine in modern world history and the greatest human rights catastrophe of the 20th century. Mao and the agents of his particularly virulent brand of war communism killed more innocents than Hitler. We now know that at least 40 million people died in the famine, which was a man-made famine imposed by the Communist Party in order to jumpstart industrial development and leap China into the modern world. And approximately 32 million of these people who died succumbed to hunger, exhaustion, and overwork in the collective fields. And this famine has shaped and influenced the way in which rural people continue to see the party state. The point I want to emphasize here is that the Great Leap Famine, which engendered a social disaster, also ended with a state legitimacy crisis, the first order that's often not talked about or um, related in a low key, if you will, when people talk about contemporary China. At the height of the famine in 1960-61, communist leaders in Beijing were so frightened that they would be challenged and overthrown by people who were the living survivors of the famine in the countryside. <clears throat> It's fair to say they were in a state of panic. China's farmers could no longer be convinced by Mao and his people that the Communist Party could handle food security issues within the Leninist system of power. And the Communist Party agents of the Great Leap had repressed and often eliminated all elementary strategies of family survival. So by the end of 1961, it was clear to rural people who had survived this state-induced calamity um, that they had to do so, and indeed had done so by saving themselves through a range of survival strategies. So the, they fought to sustain these strategies in the face of uh, state repression, these including ev everything from concealing grain harvest to pilfering the crops of the collective field to pursuing black markets to, for that matter, eating the standing crops in the field before the state could get its hands on the crops and spirit them away um, to its communal granaries. All of these strategies were tabooed and suppressed by the party state. In other words, by the time we get to the end of 1960 and the start of 1961, Mao and his people had lost the mandate to rule the countryside. And they faced widespread, low-profile resistance. All the imperial dynasties had laid claim to legitimacy by addressing food security issues. However, and this is very important, in the aftermath of the famine, <clears throat> Beijing failed to institute uh, anything like what we would think of as an anti-famine uh, contract, thereby ruining the Communist Party's chances to regain the mandate of heaven or the mandate to govern, a mandate that initially won in the Civil War with the Guomindang, as we all know. To give you an idea of how dangerously acute the crisis of legitimacy was at the height of the Great Leap Famine, top communist officials, including General Song Rinchong, who had joined Mao's Red Army in 1927 and assumed directorship of the People's Liberation Army General Cadre Department expressed fears that a new rebel emperor would arise from a mass revolt in rural China and would replace Mao and his communist-led government. We did not know that until about 10 years ago. It is important to emphasize that the famine of the Great Leap actually did not end in 1961. This is a point I want to underscore for you. Um, most scholars assume it ended then. It did not. Uh, think of it as a hurricane that was at, a, at, a, at its peak in 1960 at a, as a level five force storm. What actually happened is that peasant struggles to take back private plots of household land, uh, stay in the black market, in combination with minimal Beijing-directed reforms, allowed millions of rural dwellers to begin to recover a small measure of food security. And so by the close of 1962, the famine did indeed begin to subside. It's over with in the cities by October 1, 1962, when people celebrate uh, National uh, Liberation Day, but not in the countryside. Mao quickly recolonized the countryside from 62 to 65, and for the next two decades until after reform in 1978, so roughly about 1982 to 85, rural people in the interior were locked into a long-term low-grade famine, a level one hurricane famine, if you will. In this period, millions lived a submarginal existence, and they only crawled back to subsistence in the mid-1980s, or about three to four years before the Tiananmen crisis. 
I'm giving you this information because I want you to see how enduring this crisis was. When I went to one of the poorest villages I visited and done research in in rural China, Qiji Village was a Catholic village in Hunan province. We talked with these people in 1986 and 87. 1986 was the first year that they got back to subsistence. Before that, they had lived a submarginal existence and gotten by through small-scale petty theft, uh, limited uh, forms of uh, banditry, uh, and begging. Um, so all through this period, 1960 to 90, the Communist Party has this continuing legitimacy crisis in rural China. People still live with everyday fears of yet another round of party-induced dearth and famine, and they do not trust the party has people in it who can either address the political causality of the famine or forge a developmental strategy that will allow them to freely and effectively meet the consumption needs of their households. Now this brings us to the current period and some continuities, which real people see uh, through the memories um, of their most, this most terrible episode of Maoist rule. Um, the first of these themes that I want to talk about is that the central government in Beijing has done very little to change the work style of its political base in the countryside. So the modality of rule that formed among rural party cadres in the deep interior uh, has not been significantly altered in 40 years uh, and in these decades following the Maoist period uh, and the famine. And the, the, the important point here is that the Communist Party led center in Beijing needs this rural political base to maintain uh, its order in the countryside. And I want to stress that this political work style formed in the years of war communism and crystallized in, crystallized in the capstone years of the Great Leap Forward and its famine. So it's a work style that rural people associate with the party's abandonment of the mandate of heaven and with its violations of their most basic social rights and entitlements. And we can understand the work style as the ABCs of the Communist Party's approach to politics. Uh, we're talking about arbitrary rule, brutality, corruption, deception, and entitlement. It was this work style that took over the Great Leap campaign and turned it into a terror famine. And rural people have not forgotten the disempowerment and loss <clears throat> delivered by this work style. It's still there in everyday memories and it still influences a political thought for ordinary villagers. What my research is on, which I'm not talking to you about today, is how the memory of this work style uh, often, uh, when pricked by injustice today, uh, serves as a catalyst to mobilize people uh, against uh, party injustice in the countryside. But two examples of how this works in terms of memories that keep alive popular indignation uh, over the party's rule and how the mouse past seeps down to influence and direct how people see the party state in the present. I'll be real quick on this. Uh, I want to talk to you about uh, two thieves. These are two different thieves, two stories about uh, two thieves that we gleaned from our research in rural Anhui and in Hanan villages. Um, in the first uh, story uh, about Thief A, at the height of the Great Leap Famine, the Communist Party secretary in this particular Anhui village uh, announced to villagers one morning that he had found this deep imprint outside of the granary from which grain had been stolen. And he led um, all kinds of uh, uh, local village um, groups, mobilized you know, 20, 30, 100 people around the village in search parties to try to find the thief. They never found the thief. 30 years later, it came out uh, that the party secretary was the thief. People did not find this amusing when they learned it. I want you to compare that with, with the Thief B story. Thief B is a, a story comes out of a village I've done a long uh, stint of research in. Um, in this particular situation, <clears throat> we're also dealing with a footprint. Thief B came from outside of the village. Uh, and he came into the village in the dead of night, and he stole an oxen. There was a spate of animal theft at the height of the famine when people were desperate for food. Um, and he took this oxen outside of the village and covered himself by putting human uh, cotton-soled human sho shoes on the, on the oxen. In other words, he put shoes on, uh, you know, that one of us would have worn, right? 
Uh, and so then the tracks, when they go out, you know, they just uh, sift in with other uh, human footprints and nobody can figure out uh, where, where the thief uh, and the oxen went because they can't trace the oxen. Uh, and when the, when the villagers told, told me this story, uh, all of them not only found the story to be uh, hilarious, uh, they also said two things. One, they admired the thief because he was so cunning. And two, it's very clear that to them this was an act of empowerment because it gave them hope there was some way around this ever vigilant uh, political control of the cadres who were keeping their property and their harvest from them. Um, so the question here is why is this work style persisted? And the short answer is that the central disciplinary of the Communist Party in Beijing has never recovered the will <clears throat> or the means to correct it since the Great Leap Forward, when it lost the will and the ability to constrain and penalize village and township level cadres who perfected it. Although this work style persisted in everyday cadre relations with villagers in the reform period, we usually only hear about it in crisis moments of state command, when there is some kind of very serious high profile incident that brings it to our attention. I'm going to give you a couple examples of this, uh, which I assume you're probably familiar with. The first is the SARS crisis. Why did it become a crisis? The Communist Party lied about it. They covered it up, and it was only after a whistleblower who was a 70-year-old PLA doctor revealed this cover-up that Beijing admitted there was a problem, and, and then allowed the World Health Organization in to begin to monitor the situation, by which time it had already spread to Hong Kong and killed doctors and nurses there and other parts of the globe. So here, you want to go back to D. Um, what we experience in the big, high-profile international uproar over SARS is experienced by rural people in their everyday relations with party-based tyrants in the villages and the towns. They're not even on our radar. The second example of this work style, the coming to the front burner and structuring how China is actually ruled, is the most recent food safety crisis involving melamine additives to baby milk powder. We know that melamine had, introdu had been introduced into animal feed in China as early as 2004 and of course, there's this wave of pet deaths in 2007. And even then, um, the leadership did not create testing uh, capabilities or adequately supervise the use of melamine. And this is one reason why the Sanlu Milk Powder Group did not see a problem with melamine in their product. Once the head of this group was informed of this problem in 2008, it already was the eve of the Beijing Olympics, and President Hu Jintao, the supreme leader of the party, had issued center instructions that mandated all localities to not create or broadcast any incidents that might damage China's image during the Olympic Games. So he basically signaled local party leaders and business people under their jurisdiction that they should keep quiet or lie. And this is precisely what the Sanlu uh, Baby Milk Powder Group did. And in the meantime, the product was distributed to tens of thousands of infants, and all of us know uh, the resulting damage and trauma. This is precisely the kind of institutional deception that produced the food crisis of the Great Leap Forward. Uh, and for that matter, the use of poisonous food substitutes by Beijing in 1960 and 61. It's little known fact that when the famine raged and reached its crisis, the Communist Party leaders scurried to manufacture substitute foods uh, through unscientific methods. And they did not tell people those foods were poisonous. People died from those foods. The past is in the present. Secondly, we want to talk about political corruption for a few moments. <clears throat> this has continued and exploded in the reform area. So let's turn back to this crisis of legitimacy when General Sung expressed these fears of the CCP being overthrown. One of the issues underlying this crisis was party-based corruption. Corruption did not cause the Great Leap Famine and the massive loss of life, but it compounded the famine and spiked the death rate in many areas. Let me give an example of how this worked at the micro rice roots level. In the period of the communes, the Mao Party state set up a public dining hall system in the countryside. In theory, everyone, including local party leaders, township and commune uh, leaders, and village leaders, as well as ordinary villagers, was to take meals in the public dining halls and eat the same quality and same amount of food. In practice, however, in many rural places, the local party leaders set up secret hush kitchens paralleling the public dining halls, and the leaders and the key members of their networks ate as much food as they wanted in these hush kitchens. And this food was very good food. It was rice, it was pork, it was ducks, eggs. Uh, while ordinary villagers had to get by on watered-down soup of the public canteens, eat grass, tree bark, 
frogs, snakes to survive if they were fortunate. And when the state confiscated virtually all of the grain via procurement and banned private vegetable production and cut the public dining hall ration, the soup was inadequate to sustain life. Meanwhile, the banquets and the pig, pig outs continued. Moreover, the local party leaders often continuously held meetings in different villages, uh, different communes, and each time they went to, went to one of these meetings, they participated in a banquet. The point for us is that this pattern of plunder continued into the reform period, and in fact, it became the order of the day. Recently, in our interaction with Min Xinpei, we learned that corruption is a tool of power and even necessary to sustain power and governance in China. Indeed, some China scholars like Kate Zhou at the University of Hawaii say it's a weapon of the week, at least in the reform period. And people can use money and income earned to bribe officials. This, by the way, is not a bad thing necessarily because they could not do this in the Mao era when the state killed commerce and there was no money. So we have a picture by and large in the scholarly literature of corruption somehow contributing to re regime stability. Yet at the same time in the thinking of Machiavelli and Montesquieu and Rousseau, corruption was a force that threatened to destroy virtuous political order and erode state legitimacy. And from top ranks China scholars like Lucien Bianco in France, we learned that corruption historically has threatened regime stability in China. It was a factor in the fall of the Kuomintang. Apparently, Hu Jintao, the supreme leader of China, agrees with this logic. On December 5, 2002, Hu and several Politburo members visited Shibaipo village in Hebei province in the eastern part of the Taihang Mountains. During an overnight stay, Hu gave a speech about the critical urgency of fighting corruption in China, saying that corrupt officials were forcing people to rise up against the government. Chairman Hu pointed out that most of the 500 daily demonstrations and protests were against government corruptions. The slogans of the Protesters included, as he said, we want to rebel, we want to live, down with corrupt government, down with pseudo-socialism, down with bureaucratic capitalism. And according to a report in Zhengming, who subsequently gave a speech in a secret emergency meeting at the Politburo in which he say, stated, it is not a few local governments, but most of the local governments. It's not a few officials, but most of the officials that are corrupt and suppressing people with state power. Are they not forcing people to rebel against the central government? Are they not forcing people to rise up to overthrow the Communist Party, unquote? Well, was Hu being overly dramatic? <clears throat> While he was making these overtures and statements, the farmers interviewed by my, my work research team <clears throat> told us that the Communist Party is more corrupt than the Kuomintang, and its fate would be that of the Kuomintang. Now, this is significant not just because they said it, but because of who they were. These are people in distant villages who risked death in helping the Communist Party overthrow the Kuomintang during the Civil War. On a similar note, <clears throat> in this same time frame, roughly about 1998 to 2002 <clears throat> or so, Chiao Shi, who was the head of secret police in China and retired recently, was seized and spirited away by the public security people when he spouted off in the airport in Guangzhou on a trip that China could have another rule-based rebellion that could spread to Beijing like prairie fire. <clears throat> I want to make a few points about corruption in contemporary China. First, the corruption in the reform period has its roots in a pattern of political decay that began with the Maoist revolutionary mobilizations of the 1950s, particularly the misconduct of uneducated and undisciplined party leaders who took charge of the Great Leap. This pattern, which Lu Xiaobo at Columbia has termed organizational involution, persisted into the post-Mao period, giving village and township power holders freedom to plunder without penalty. So poorly regulated party-based corruption continued into the reform period, mutating into what Min Xinpei has so aptly called the centralized state predation. This predation is often combined with violence. I'm going to return to something we just talked about. Here's an example. The banquets of the Great Leap Forward. The pattern of cadres eating the food of farmers and these pig outs that we talked about in the years of the husk kitchens. <clears throat> in the reform period, these banquets were revived, especially in periods of campaigns, the most notorious of which has been the family can planning campaigns. The central government and its county governments frequently have sent in family planning enforcement squads to the villages to make people comply with state mandates limiting the number of children farm families can produce. 
And these squads are often sent to villages to find and punish violators. They will punch a hole in somebody's roof or tear a roof off if you violated po policy or to round up women for forced abortions. And during their village stays, they participate in banquets, eating the grain that is taken from villagers <clears throat> for taxes. And this often dials up memories of past corruption, pig outs, and abuse. Local villagers hate this. In fact, uh, they told us that this was the top of their list of party state corruption. And they openly call the parties who hold these banquets thieves and pigs. Of course, this is a language of hostile contention. It seriously damages the legitimacy of the government and further erodes its ability to rule. This pattern has been fueled by unfunded mandates of the central government, but what's important here for us to keep in mind is what many scholars, most American scholars who study China, see as a problem of local corruption is actually a national problem. Corruption locally persisted in the Deng area, in the Deng era, in the post-Deng Xiaoping period, because the national level Communist Party failed to reform the system of governance and create disciplinary mechanisms for controlling political corruption of its sub-county agents in the deep interior. So the problem also is uh, sustained by patron-client ties to the party state because this system of patronage in China excludes ordinary villagers. Secondly, the corruption that we're talking about is designed and structured often by the central government that Hu Jintao heads. The center has national monopolies in transportation, energy, and telecommunications, and these dinosaurs are carryovers from the Mao period and have only minimally been reformed. In the reform period, the state structuring of public services and industries delivering public goods has produced what Yan Sun has termed joint monopoly. And what this really means is that the central government officials in charge of these monopolies, along with their locally based agents, have carried out reform in accordance with the same formula that produced corruption in the Mao era and the commune period. When Corruption helped make for a disaster. The formula is right out of Kiltgaard's classic conception, monopoly plus discretion minus accountability equals corruption. As Ramsa Karklins has found for Eastern Europe, in rural China, the local agents of the pre-reform period, these are party agents and their, their networks, have joined with high state trained managers of economic reform to perpetuate their economic privileges, all in the name of serving the public good. So the officials at the center have allowed these local party cadres and clients to seize economic power and reap the benefits of reform and modernity. I'm going to give you an example or two of how this plays out in terms of protest and contention. I'm not really talking much about protest and contention today, um, rather some of its institutional origins and causes. Uh, in 2005, there was a, <clears throat> a protest movement in a place called Shengyou Village in Hebei province. This was tied up with the Ministry of Electricity, which Li Peng, the autocrat who helped authorize the suppression of the Tiananmen movement. <clears throat> um, in response to the attempt of Hebei officials uh, to confiscate villager land to build up a state-owned Guohua Dingzhou power plant and a coal ash storage facility, um, villagers basically um, refused to give up their land, partly because the compensation package was inadequate. So the local government, acting on orders from higher-ups, attempted to drive the villagers off their land by force. Farmers fought back. Six of them were killed. Many were wounded. The local police allowed the killings by hired thugs. The central government, it is true, later sacked the Communist Party secretary in charge of this area and also the mayor of Dingzhou. But what mainstream news reporters and scholars did not report is this. First of all, when something like this happens, Beijing immediately tries to keep it out of the news and cover it up. Second, the link to high state power and central government monopoly is hushed up. In this case, none of the mainstream Chinese or Western media reported what ordinary people in rural China knew, and that is that this Guohua Dingzhou power plant is a subsidiary of the Li Peng family energy power monopoly. And, and Li Xiaopeng, the manager of the power station, believed to be behind the violent eviction of the Shengyu villagers is Li Peng's son. This family runs major state-owned power plants throughout China as their private businesses, and they likely hired the thugs to do the dirty work of driving farmers off the land. Finally, in cases like this one, the center invariably scapegoats these local officials who are cashiered, dismissed, or jailed. Uh, and this is be important because it helps cover up the link to the Leninist Center's culpability. And by the way, this scapegoating started, this, this scapegoating started in the Mao period. 
uh, right after, especially after the famine. Um, so we have a continuity here too. Um, and as I said, the central government maintains these monopolies in transport, energy, and telecommunications. Um, and so the corruption of the ministries really in charge of these monopolies is a major factor that drives protest and contention. One of my favorite examples is something you can go back and review that was given on NPR about 10 days ago, which has to do with uh, Leo Giorgio and, and the Ministry of Railways. Uh, he, he's been the minister since 2003. Um, as you know, we just ushered in the year of the ox, and uh, millions upon millions of people travel for holiday, uh, and they've long faced a problem which has gotten worse under reform. The problem is they cannot get train tickets, and the reason is the Ministry of Railways scalps about 30 to 40 percent of the tickets to its cronies, okay, and then they, they, they take the other 10 percent for people in government, so ordinary folks, citizens have about 30 to 40 that they can buy at ticket windows. Um, so when they go to these windows, they often find that there are no tickets. Um, and this all came to a head on January 10 of this year. A train traveler used a cell phone to videotape a ticket seller, Clark, behind window 37. I'm not sure where this was, but I think it was in Shanghai. Um, as the clerk was putting aside a pile of 100 tickets at the same time, the traveler was told there were no tickets left for sale. And then this angry traveler exploded and uploaded the video on the internet. This triggered a firestorm of protest across China. So much was this the case that even Hu Jintao intervened, issued an ultimatum to the railway ministry officials to, quote, turn on their brains, unquote, to fix the problem. Well, what they would have taken that to mean was you've got to be more clever uh, in your corruption and exploitation. So the problem, I can assure you, was not fixed. Instead, the ministry said the ticket seller at window 37 was not doing what the video showed and apologized for the quote, misunderstanding, unquote. And the government went on to say that the problem was that the railway ticket was, uh, system was overloaded by demand. In reality, of course, the problem is there's no public oversight of the railway ministry, which I was interested to learn has its own courts and police, so very few people are going to win if they sue them. To give you an idea of how entrenched and autonomous these ministries are, um, it turns out uh, that in um, <clears throat> recently, Liu Zhishang, the head of the Wuhan train station, was given a suspended death sentence for amassing a small fortune via corruption, selling these tri tickets to cronies and scalpers. And this Liu Zhishang is the brother of the head of the Ministry of Railways we just mentioned. Also, it's the case for many years uh, this is not in the NPR report. I, I, I followed this for many years. Every, every time they come to New Year's or a really important holiday, uh, you know, they, will, they will jack up the prices, uh, especially so if you're a poor rural migrant, you're trying to get back to your hometown, you've got very little money for a ticket, um, you're going hit, to get hit very hard. Um, there's a lot of public resentment over this, to say the least. Third, uh, we're going to talk about for a moment what has happen, happened to democracy under the Communist Party. And I'm going to be very brief here. If you want to ask me some more uh, um, qu questions that are outside of what I'm going to cover, I'd be happy to entertain them. Uh, but the important point for us is that the Communist Party um, has captured and distorted elections and democratic mechanisms for empowerment. And so how has it done this? First of all, <clears throat> by choosing leaders. When elections occur locally, the party steals the nomination process. This is very clear. Uh, and I've studied this in depth in, in one village, and we've talked to people in many other villages, uh, and this is a very serious problem. Um, so in other words, it gets its own people nominated. Uh, <clears throat> and secondly, it violates secret ballot practices uh, and the voting process. It has roving ballots. It carries ballots to people's houses. Um, it often suggests how they are to vote right in front of them. There's no transparency once the, the ballots are collected. They spirit them off to the township government. It's very difficult for people to have any independent checks on, on vote counting. Uh, and then, then thirdly, the, the, they do not allow write-in candidates to win for the most part. Uh, the Communist Party finds some pretext to prevent these people from taking office when they win elections if they're not their people. Um, uh, this happened uh, in the village uh, that I've studied the most. Um, and uh, the person who, who won as a write-in actually was not even campaigning, but had a long history of resisting uh, corruption and taxation, over-taxation in the village. The process of Communist Party guided 
electoral democracy, which has gone on from about 1988 when the experiment began to about 1998, uh, has ended up corrupting electoral politics to a point where it's engendered great disappointment among village people in China. So what started out as a process that promised voice and some level of empowerment in the late 80s was captured and distorted to a point where rural people who wanted elections to choose their own leaders, and by the way, they do want elections to choose their own leaders. Um, their hopes were dashed. Consequently, many have begun to think that elections are useless. There's great cynicism about democracy under the mentorship of the Communist Party. Um, and for good reason. The party is all but usurped and defeated uh, the democratic prospect in rural China. That's not to say that the prospect is dead. <clears throat> It's important to emphasize that some of the local villagers who stepped forth and ran in the elections already were esteemed protest leaders. This point is often left out of the scholarly literature. They often had stood up against entrenched party leaders and fought against the party schemes to tax them or to impose draconian family planning measures in the 80s and 90s so that the usurpation of this electoral process was from the standpoint of local people a way of beating back popular resistance to party delivered corruption and coercion. A lot of these proto-Democrats who lost elections to Communist Party nominees were later also tagged as troublemakers, treated as subversives. So their exclusion from the political system means they will strive to find non-institutionalized ways of resolving grievances. In other words, they'll go outside uh, of the channels um, that are sanctioned by the party state. Uh, just a small footnote here. <clears throat> if you look at uh, Chinese history from uh, the time that Mao and the Communist Party takes power. Every time there has been a promise of democracy or open political discourse, uh, whether it was in the late 40s, early 50s, or again, the 100 flowers in, in, in uh, 1957, uh, every time they have uh, backed out of that promise and jettisoned uh, the, the process that was supposed to deliver it, uh, you've had trouble in the countryside. <clears throat> the trouble in the area that I've been studying takes the form of arsons against party secretaries. If people stayed in power through subverting these elections or uh, they had their uh, mentored cronies put in power uh, through the sorted processes I've just talked about, then often we find that they were, their homes were torched. Um, that was a warning that you don't want to you don't want to run again. A lot of these people have been driven out of office by this, or at least uh, they've, been, they've been sort of, if you will, uh, sent a warning uh, that the politics as usual will no, will no longer be tolerated. Um, fourthly, let's talk about the petition system, which is really, in, in a sense, one of the most important things I want to discuss with you this evening. Um, <clears throat> The Communist Party has corrupted and curtailed this system, which historically was a way for the central government uh, to create a political stability in the countryside. And it acted as a political warning system for state leaders looking to diffuse popular protests and contention in the countryside. From imperial times on, <clears throat> China's central government leaders fashioned a very effective system of allowing for popular grievances and complaints against officials. And even uh, the most lowly commoners had a right to engage the system. This was a system of petitioning, also known as a system of letters and visits. So how did it work? Well, people with grievances and claims against official mistreatment or government wrongdoing would enlist local notables, gentry figures, village and township leaders in order to present their grievances to government officials. Many of the petition letters were penned by intermediate level elites, so a village school teacher, a scribe, a minor gentry figure, a lawyer, who would write the petition for an illiterate or semi-literate farmer and then present it to proper authorities. And historically, this system provided an information link between powerless villagers and powerful officials, and it obliged those in power to engage in political discourse with country dwellers. Moreover, it was legal. If necessary, rural people who could get, <clears throat> who could get justice through this system did so. Um, and those people who could not um, get just settlements of grievances through petitioning locally could travel all the way to the provincial capital or even to uh, Beijing, to the Ministry of Justice, and some petitions even found their way to the emperor. The important point here for us is 
that this system not only served as a channel for claims making, but also an advanced warning system for higher ups, alerting them to trouble festering in far off places. When this system was working its best, it allowed high officials to address problems generating individual grievances that might evolve into shared grievances. And so it diffused the potential for collective protest and ramified political contention. Now, I studied this uh, system in detail for the Republican period, and it worked pretty well even in periods of chaos. The petitions that local people presented to the local gentry and the county magistrates in the pre-49 period often led to peaceful negotiations and dispute resolutions on behalf of uh, besieged farmers. And there were acceptable settlements that were reached in many counties. Where this process failed, ironically, the Guomindang got into trouble with local people and the communists gained popular support and built up political capital locally. So supposedly they would understand the importance of this. Some articles I read on the internet recently said that the petitioning process was revived by the Mao-led Communist Party after 1949. <clears throat> Nothing could be further from the truth. Actually, Mao thwarted this process in two ways, and the heavy state socialist suppression of this process was one reason why the Great Leap Forward spawned a terrible famine. In 1958 and 59, when young teachers and farmers from Anhui and Henan provinces, some of whom were members of the Communist Youth League, saw that the radical excesses of the Great Leap were engendering scarcity and acute hunger, they collected stories of farmers' grievances and included these in letters and petitions to Mount. They roamed through two or three provinces, by the way, to do this. I'm just talking about two or three villages in a county here or there. They, they rain, roamed far and wide. But many of these petitions and letters were either suppressed or if they reached Mao, then he sent them back to the provincial party secretaries and told them to look into the grievances and complaints. So that the very Leninist party structure that had generated the grievances was <clears throat> that generated these grievances in the first place was handling the grievance petitions now. As a result, the warnings of dire radical food scarcity were ignored by Mao and his people, and a great famine rapidly unfolded in 15 provinces while the petitions process was being abandoned. And by the time party leaders in Beijing realized the extent of the famine in 59, roughly April, uh, at that point, 25 million people were on the brink of starvation. It was too late. And one of the reasons it was too late is this petitions process had been suppressed and all but <clears throat> dismissed. So why is this important? We've been told that the central government of Hu Jintao is committed to reforming the petitioning system. But in 2006, Hu Jintao started once again to discourage petitions and letters and announced that the central government was sending rural petitioners who were coming to Beijing back to their localities to meet with local county officials and police chiefs in order to resolve their complaints. We know from the state petitions office that 80% of the millions of petitions were legitimate, but less than 1% were resolved. So I want to go through some quick details about petitions over the past five years. <clears throat> First of all, in the past five years, the central government has allowed or even encouraged the growth of so-called interceptors. There are some 3,000 minimally of these people employed in Beijing. Who are they? They are informal police who intercept and interfere with petitioners who come to the capital to present their claims to the state petition office. And these interceptors will take away the identifications of rural people who are the petitioners so they cannot file their petition. You can't file unless you have ID. And this has led to struggles and fights with the interceptors. In the past, one or two petitioners were powerless to get through. Uh, four or five interceptors, but now you'll find petitioners from provinces organizing groups of 20, 30, 40 of their strongest petitioners to fight and break through these interceptor lines to register their petitions. Secondly, local county and provincial officials and their thugs um, have come to Beijing to round up petitioners uh, from their home provinces and beat them. They attack uh, some of the petitioners' villages in 2007. Um, it's also the case that there have been police sweeps they put petitioners in black jails and in illegal detention centers. Most importantly, the petitioners increasingly have been extradited or deported back to their home counties. As Sarah Meg Davis is a Penn, University of Pennsylvania trained anthropologist and has done some work for Human Rights Watch, has noted, this Beijing-backed system of deportation is like sending sheep to meet with wolves, quote, unquote. In some cases, the, the police chiefs were the same police chiefs who were ordered to beat in prison and deter the petitioners from coming to Beijing in the first place. These are, these are people they were sent back to. 
Uh, and in some cases, the police chiefs and their superiors at the county level were in fact the people the petitioners were targeting in the first place. So once again, we see under reform that petitioners have no protection from this system of single party dictatorship. And we, we also know that half the petitioners who have been sent back to the countryside have reported some kind of reprimand or retaliation. No wonder that so many people we've interviewed have told us they do not petition. We, we, have, a, we have a lot of data on you know, how many people have petitioned and in the concept, but we don't have much data on, you know, well, how many people would like to petition but haven't petitioned because they are frightened. Um, fifthly, there are disappearances. Two months ago, around December 7th, Sun Wun Fa was a petitioner in Xindai and Shandong was abducted by local officials in the city. Um, and uh, he had uh, petitioned higher ups in Beijing uh, in the Bureau of Letters and Calls to compensate him and other people in his village because of excessive mining had damaged their homes and their farmlands. And he was kidnapped and escorted back to his native area and thrown into a mental hospital. And when the news reporters followed this story up, they found that 18 to other 20 people had met this fate. And the officials who detained them uh, 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 said that they were under great pressure from the upper government because they could not handle the disputes of petitioners locally. So they started working with Xindai Lei's in office in Beijing to take people back to the township into this mental uh, hospital. Sixthly, and, and lastly, this, this system has, of petitions has been infused with bribery in the last two to uh, three years. Yu Jin Rung, uh, who's a Chinese scholar who studied this, found that the leaders of lower government units charged with processing the petitioners were urged by higher ups to sell a registration number or ticket to the petitioners. And they came under pressure to keep the number of tickets to a minimum so they could restrict the scale of the petitions. So in an effort to make sure they have these authoritarian controls over the petitioners, the government instituted this system of selling of registration tickets, uh, if you will, which gave rise to a bribery chain. And there are many consequences of this. The most important one to my mind is that most rural people, I think, cannot afford to pay for these tickets or numbers. So this means that the people who are approved for petitions are going to be those with connections um, and with money. So why do people bring their petitions to Beijing in the first place? The answer is because the local courts refuse to accept the cases. Uh, we know from Xu Jinrung's study of 600 petitions uh, that uh, some 65% had taken their cases to local courts first, 43% uh, were not accepted, 55% were handled unlawfully, that is, there were legal procedural violations. So 98% of the 65% had been shut out of court justice. Moreover, the cases were very explosive politically, and this is important for us, because most are about local government corruption, and the vast majority are focused on land grabbing, which has been a front burner issue the last uh, two to five years. And about 50% of the petitioners who came to Beijing did so because of local government attacks and arrests of local protest leaders. So this is the point. Their petitions clearly were not just about material claims. They were addressing also political repression. That, and, and so uh, these people were basically victims of state repression, and they were attempting to get justice from the center. So what is the political fallout from all of this? First of all, I think since local officials are under tremendous pressure to prevent petitions from circulating locally, or from winding their way up the bureaucracy to the provincial level and to the central government, Beijing increasingly does not really know what is going on in the countryside. This is precisely what happened in the Great Leap Forward under Mao. When they cut off this process, and, and, and this was there before the world of 20th century and the promise of democracy, and it worked fairly well, and it kept China pretty stable. Um, it led to a great disaster, which took the form of the famine. And so first of all, I think there is one dangerous political consequence that stands out, and that is the center cannot process and address all of these demands. And hence, more people will stop believing in its propaganda line, which is that Beijing is their benefactor. And they're going to more and more question the authority and legitimacy of the center. And indeed, one study shows that the percentage of those who thought the center welcomed their petitions and would protect their rights to petition has fallen, especially after they presented those petitions and then they ran in uh, to this buzzsaw that I, I talked about a moment ago, whether it's uh, the interceptors or uh, they're being uh, deported back to the countryside. There's another political danger in suppressing the petitioners. This creates the possibility of alliances between different groups of local people who otherwise would go their own way politically, so to speak. 
Many of these people who have drafted the petitions and organized trans village petition movements are people whose livelihood has improved under reform. We're talking about uh, people who have assumed pivotal roles in organizing petitions, village school teachers, retired army veterans, small traders and entrepreneurs, and a few of the better off migrant workers. We know that rule-based rebellions have often been spearheaded by conservative, relatively well-to-do little people who initially attempted to address their grievances through deferential protests, not just in China, but the world over. And it was only after the state used force against them that they turned to radical uh, politics and raised the flag of revolt. So the challenge for the central government is whether it can keep its far-flung police forces and auxiliary forces, many of whom are drawn from undisciplined thugs in the countryside, in line and not alienate these moderate elements, turning their deferential protest into confrontations that drive them to contentious acts that pose a direct challenge to the state. Min Chin Pei talked about selective repression, whether the state can actually persuade these people to engage in clever and crafty and effective selective repression is an open question. <clears throat> well, we'll turn to the last theme now. And this is actually something that I'm doing a lot of work on um, and I'm giving you just a thumbnail sketch. Um, the, the Communist Party has failed to resolve the issue of rural surplus labor. And the way in which it has addressed this issue promises to generate discontent and more contention. Were it not for this failure, the above mentioned four themes and problems I've discussed would not matter so much politically. But the problem of rural surplus labor in China is massive, and it's from rural surplus labor that the foot soldiers of rebellion have always come. In imperial times and in the Republican period, Min Xinpei, Min Xinpei is right when he says that people who pose a threat to the party state's imperial power today are not peasants and they're not workers. But his assertion that it's intellectuals who pose that threat has to be qualified. <clears throat> it's excluded lumpen intellectuals in combination with marginalized, semi-rooted rural people who have led this charge um, in bringing down the dynasties. Indeed, we know that Mao drew his recruits uh, from these people in the pre-49 period. In the post-1949 period, the Communist Party dealt with this problem by creating an apartheid system. Um, this system addressed the problem of underemployment and unemployment of the rural poor. And this system was the People's Communes, which was an institutionalized system of internal colonization that separated rural dwellers from city people and used an internal passport system known as, known as the HUCO, our household registration system to keep villagers down on the farm. And the party used this system to prevent labor mobility and dictate <clears throat> the terms of work life in the collective. It's well known that in the Deng Xiaoping reform period, the central government has relaxed this hukou system and allowed more people who could not eke out a living by farming to move to the cities so that we get a great burst of labor mobility and a newfound freedom to move the body to jobs and food security in urban coastal maritime sectors where China's export economy has developed and where foreign capital knowledge and technology is poured into China. By the time we get into the third decade of the 20th, uh, third decade of reform, the 21st century, China has approximately 120 to 150 million rural to urban migrant workers who've left the dead farmlands of the interior and traveled back and forth to the cities for work. Approximately 40 million of these people go to work in the construction industry, and I want to stress that these people, more often than not, are the poorest of the rural poor, people who cannot make a living by farming the land. They face two problems. On the one hand, they're from households with too many people and too many land. So the problem of land to labor ratios described in R.H. Taney's classical land and labor in China is still there in the dead, infertile lands of the interior. Um, on the other hand, they do not have enough capital to secure the inputs that are required to rejuvenate and sustain farming of these poor, teeny strips of farmland. Uh, they, they, can't, they don't have the money to purchase things like uh, uh, seeds, chemical fertilizer, and so on. Uh, moreover, they do not have the educational training or capital to start up small business or side occupations that would provide them with off-farm income. And one reason for this is the Great Leap Famine left them without any resources, and the Great Leap and the Cultural Revolution seriously damaged and sometimes destroyed schools and education in China. So the critical point I want to stress here is that the dawn of reform, these people had nothing. I assure you, if you read the literature on China, you will not find anyone talking about this. But it's there in spades. 
in most of what I've studied and most of the interviews that I've collected uh, over the last 20 years. What does this mean? It means they were unprepared to go it alone in a market economy <clears throat> so that they became the cannon fodder for the construction industry, which was under the control of Communist Party labor bosses and contractors. As a result, the 40 million who go into the construction industry sector are exploited. They have no legal rights. There are no legalized trade unions. Worse yet, when they do go to work in the cities, they're sequestered in work sites where the terms of work life are highly exploited. So much is this the case, these urban construction work sites are actually makeshift labor camps that replicate some of the worst features of the extra village labor camps that were created in the course of the Great Leap Campaign. I don't have time to get into this in detail, but let me give you a couple examples. First of all, the poor villagers who go to these construction industry jobs are at the mercy of labor contractors who make them verbal non-binding promises of wages to be paid upon finishing a job. However, it's often the case that the contractors and subcontractors default on these wage promises and disappear with the promised wages before payment is due, so that the migrant workers in the construction industry are left high and dry and are literally cheated out of six to 12 months of salaries due, due them for backbreaking work uh, in highly dangerous work environments where there's no medical insurance and no physician care. This is precisely the pattern of labor exploitation that occurred in the Great Leap and Mao's attempt to industrialize the countryside. <clears throat> In other words, if you go into work in, a, in an area in China and you're a construction worker and, and you get a job, there's, there's no upfront salary. They'll say, okay, we, you, we're going to pay you this in six months or nine months or 12 months. And you only get it if you, stay, if you endure and you, you know, survive and, 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 and you're, you're fortunate. Um, and many are not because, as I said, they're often not paid. Um, second, we have to ask, <clears throat> why do the migrant workers stay on these jobs? Uh, if the situation uh, is so horrendous. And the majority of the migrants, <clears throat> I think, were migrants for several reasons. First of all, they go to the cities for food. Um, uh, and uh, secondly, they go to garner income to send back home to help out parents and siblings with medical care costs. This is a major factor. And also to save up uh, enough money to get married and build a house back in the country. So the overwhelming majority of these people in construction are males. I want to dwell on this first factor for a moment. The food on the job sites is, to say the least, horrendous. It's watered down soup with all kinds of vermin mixed in it. It's filled with MSG, which thickens the thin gruel, but has the side effect of making workers feel full after eating small amounts, so that several hours after eating, they're often ravaged with hunger. Uh, they're not allowed to eat except when the labor bosses tell them, and, and sometimes they'll go from 12 noon until 9 or 10 at night without being able to get uh, food or water. The water issue is deadly. It's dirty. There are multiple cases of extreme diarrhea and dehydra dehydration. And this has proved to be fatal in the downfall of many migrant workers. <clears throat> Actually, the situation is far worse than I'm suggesting here. So again, why do they stay? And especially since they con constantly have to live in the f with the fear of non-payment of wages. This is just a constant fear in the lives of all of these people. That, that the labor boss will run off with their wages when it's time to be paid. And I think the answer is that their strategy of dealing with this problem of employer default on wages is to shift as many of the upfront costs onto their employers, the most important of which is to demand food and housing as part of the payment for employment. So in a sense, therefore, rather than never, um, if you will, seeing their earnings, as Sarah Swidler, a colleague of mine, a sociologist at the University of Akron, has put it, uh, they at least manage to eat their earnings. And this is why so many of their everyday struggles for resistance have focused on the quality of food and housing, which often amounts to makeshift tents, poor bedding with inadequate blankets to protect them from the bite of winter. You contrast this situation for, for a moment with what we usually get in terms of neo neoliberal uh, interpretations of China, where suddenly there's a free market and everybody is uh, getting rich and lives happily ever after. <clears throat> Third, because of the state HUCO regulations, the migrant workers find it difficult to enter the cities. Since they're unregistered, they're vulnerable to extortion by state enforcement personnel, and they have very limited mo mobility in the cities, as in the Great Leap period in, in the communes. The labor contractors and their police forces also control the mobility of the construction workers, forbidding them to leave job sites with permission. In short, the reform era Communist Party has maintained a system of apartheid that existed in the countryside under Mao now shifting its previously honed structural arrangements and habitual performances to colonized urban spaces in which connected labor bosses exploit migrant workers. This sketch I've given you is important for two reasons, and I'm 
about to finish. Uh, first, if you followed the mainstream American and Chinese media, especially articles in the Boston Globe over the past couple of weeks, uh, they've been talking about the impact of the global economic recession on the migrant workforce, noting that factories and construction sites have closed down and that there have been riots because the managers and contractors have fled and absconded with whatever funds were there for the workers to be paid. This is a misreading of China's current political economy. This pattern was there all along, embedded in the modality of Communist Party rule and the tra trajectory of its economic development. And this global economic downturn that we're facing now has only amplified and exposed it and evolved a situation in which the migrant construction workers not only could not receive promised salaries, but now suddenly have no everyday food or housing. This is why they're rioting, and this is why they're turning back to the farms in great numbers. Ten million, as far as we know, already have gone back. Moreover, the assertion that contention uh, that is now, if you will, erupting in this sector is really based on ignorance. For many decades, going back into the 90s, the migrant construction workers have engaged different strategies of resistance to the non-payment of wages, including tracking down their labor contractors and subcontractors who flee and default on promised wages and confronting them in their home villages and towns and cities. And these confrontations have taken the forms of sit-ins in their homes and physical altercations. The point I want to stress here is that these people have a rich heritage of lessons in how to fight for their basic rights. And the great danger for China now is that when they go back to the countryside, they will become unemployed, real surplus labor, and find common cause with their return counterparts in villages and towns and become unruly to a point where they pose an even greater challenge to Communist Party rule. And that in time, they might align with college graduates who have been unable to find the professional work they've been trained to do and who have to return to the countryside to survive. And that these groups in alliance will enter into collective actions to challenge Communist Party corruption and rule. That would make it much more difficult for the Communist Party to effectively pursue the strategy that Min Xinpei outlined for us, which is a strategy of buying off and integrating intellectual dissidents. A uh, very short concluding note, note, which has to do with two reasons why resistance, protest, <clears throat> and rebellion most likely will not feed into insurgency in the near future. And I'm going to shortchange this because I've run over. Um, the first is very simple. <clears throat> uh, it's a simplicity that economists <clears throat> seem determined not to get. And that is uh, that in China, rural, uh, rural China, uh, urban China, all of China, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. The population is disarmed. There is no Second Amendment right in this country. Not only this, the most earth-shaking change in Chinese politics and East Asian international relations in the 20th century, I would argue, is Mao Zedong's forging of a national combat-ready revolutionary army which would make any foreign power pay a dear price to invade China again. And the Communist Party still controls this powerful army, which most likely can <clears throat> move in a real crisis of state command, put down any rebellion. Rural people are wise. They know this. This is why, ultimately, they think twice about openly challenging the Communist Party with armed struggle, even if they could get the arms. By the way, I can assure you there, 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 there is um, an upsurge in China uh, uh, over the last three decades. Every time there's been a state crisis, devolution of power, there's been, there's been an upsurge of people trying to get arms. Uh, and then the party will carry out campaigns uh, to disarm people. The second factor is equally uh, important for us, and it has to do with political psychology. It's a psychology that works, I think, against a rebellion from below. It's inextricably bound up with the painful memories of the Mao era and the Great Leap Carnage, and also the trauma of the Cultural Revolution. Virtually everyone in rural China knows that if the lid were to come off, it would be a political disaster for everyone, both for rural people and for the party state, because the anti-state contention that would erupt would be savagely violent. In our interviews over the years, both workers and peasants have told us that if there's ever another event like the Cultural Revolution when rural people move to settle scores with the perpetrators of the Great Leap Famine, this time they will not flinch. They will go all the way. They will kill every last arbitrary corrupt Communist Party leader and government official they can get their hands on. They have told us that. I'm not making it up. This is not something they want to happen. 
uh, because they too will die in this violence accompanying the release of these long pent up hatreds. In other words, they don't want another revolution. <clears throat> so let us hope, therefore, that China can find a way to resolve its terrible past, which the Communist Party Center has never publicly apologized for, and move to peace and harmonious future through non-authoritarian modalities of governance and a clear rule of law. Thank you. So I have to say, without exaggeration, I found that absolutely fascinating. I've never heard the, uh, the situation in rural China described in such a, in such a fashion, you know, such anger and such brutality, nor have I heard such a clear description of the means of control that the, that the current government uses to control this sort of rebellion. Um, there are a million and a half questions to ask you. I guess the first question in my mind is, how in the world do you ever get a visa to visit China, uh, given the way? But I'll put that aside. But why don't I, I first see if anybody in the audience has any questions um, that you'd like to raise offhand? Yes, sir. Uh, one thing that we seem to get from the media is that most of the complaints directed by the Chinese people are against local communist officials and that they seem to believe in the National Communist Party and that the National Communist Party has the, the ability to resolve the crisis. So with the, the recent earthquake or melamine or you know, the baby milk, you know, all of those issues, it seemed like the anger was directed more at the local communist officials as opposed to the National Party. And I was wondering how you think that fits in with uh, what you just presented. I should say, Ralph had asked me to use my booming loud, annoying voice and, and amplify the question really loud for everyone, including Ralph. Um, the way I understand the question is that most portrayals of the anger in the countryside um, depicts that anger as being directed at the local officials and definitely not against the central government. And is that an accurate depiction of where the anger lies? And is that a good ruling strategy for the central government? Is that fair? Yeah. It's accurate to a limited extent. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> most of the acts that are perpetrated are perpetrated by local officials. So naturally, people are going to be upset with them. But there are two things to take into account here, one of which is often, I think, uh, sort of understated. Uh, most of these people know that the local officials are appointed by higher-ups, and the higher-ups are responsible to Beijing. Okay? They know that. Uh, so they see these people as, as not just local officials per se, but as agents of higher-ups. Okay? And the second thing is, um, it's true that they need Beijing to be on their side and to be their benefactor. But as I pointed out, uh, this is a game. Uh, that the central government can only play so long without actually delivering on it. And so that poses a problem for, for local people who want justice. Um, to the extent that the central government does not literally intervene in these situations quickly and uh, make adjustments, or for that matter, engage in a preventive politics, it, it poses a continuing problem for its legitimacy. Let me, th let me take the moderator's prerogative and ask a question, which is the, um, the description you gave of the instruments of control sounded to me a little bit like Stalinist, Stalinist Soviet Union. And it occurs to me that for all the kind of worrisome overtones about instability in China, Stalinist Soviet Union never got toppled. Gorbachev Soviet Union. Um, Kim Il-sung's North Korea never got toppled. We'll wait. We'll see about Kim Jong-il. That um, the history of brutal, horrific, smart, well-organized despots maintaining control through all the tactics you, you described might be a history that shines pretty you know, favorably on the ability of those despots usually to hold control. So if I hear what you're saying, should I draw from this, wow, it's terrible to be in the Chinese countryside, and this terror will likely continue throughout my lifetime, or are you more optimistic about the prospect of change than that? Um, i answer that in two ways. First of all, <clears throat> What makes China especially volatile, and I haven't gone into this um, today, is that one thing we have to credit Deng Xiaoping for is that uh, he and his people dismantled a lot of the mechanisms of malice control and repression. I didn't talk about this. Okay. So people have more space and, and, and more freedom, which they can literally mount protests today. 
Uh, and as long as they do that within you know, the, the, the rules of what is acceptable and supposedly loyal protest, right, they're okay. But the problem is a lot of this protest is increasingly becoming transgressive. It, it, it goes beyond those rules. And, and the reason is that a lot, of the, a lot of the local leaders force the issue with it. Um, is it terrible to be in the Chinese countryside today, if, if I understand, it, and will it be in the future? One thing I have not even this hardly talked about um, is that China is a Leninist police state. Uh, and uh, at the local level, um, uh, the, the, the police forces are infused with corruption. And as Min Ximpei pointed out, many of the police forces are also entwined with local mafia. Um, so, in some ways, um, people have more uh, opportunities, they have more resources with which to protest today, um, and in some ways their protest um, can go further and bring them gains they could not possibly dream of in the Mao era when it came to a protest. It was hardly possible to even protest. Uh, but. Um, so protesting is somewhat more effective today, okay? But at the same time, um, the government is rapidly uh, modernizing and strengthening uh, the police forces up and down the line. Uh, and this, this inc includes um, the, the use of all kinds of modern uh, telecommunications, surveillance equipment, uh, so on and so forth. So um, I, I would say it's not as terrible as before, but it's still quite terrible. Other questions from the audience? Yes, ma'am. Do you think the U.S. has a role in mitigating the rural conflict? And if it does, what does that role look like? So the, again, my booming voice. Uh, the question had to do with what is the proper U.S. role in mitigating this, this conflict between Beijing and the rural areas of China? I think, the very, I think that the U.S. can do very little about this other uh, than the following. One is, of course, um, uh, to beat a louder drum when it comes to human rights issues. Um, uh, but there's one other thing that can be done, uh, and, and that is, um, I, I think, if it continues to push for exchanges um, with, with people from all walks of life in China, this helps in ways that we sometimes are unaware of. For example, I've talked with civil rights lawyers and human rights lawyers in China um, who've come here, uh, and uh, they've told me that, surprisingly, uh, the most important thing that, that we can do uh, for them in helping them with their cases, and they represent me, these people who are protesters who've been apprehended or arrested, um, whether they're a farmer somewhere or maybe, you know, a, a news reporter or a journalist, okay? Uh, is is simply uh, to keep a public eye on it, and 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 they've said that the one thing that protects people more than anything is international publicity. Um, I think that the limits of what what the U.S. government can do are are, are real, uh, that they're quite severe. We might have time for one last question, and then I have to whisk Ralph away because it's going to be a dinner. Um, Anybody have one last question? Yes, sir. Um, are, are whose kind of reforms that he's outlined, are those just kind of an empty promise based on what you've seen over the near history and, and farther back? So to what extent are, the, are whose um, uh, reforms, and wait, which reforms are you talking about? I, mean, I, I, I don't know. Reforms? Reforms? I don't know specifically, but it's just yeah. kind of, I, I've heard a lot about kind of who promising uh, reforms in the future that would bring uh, kind of more social stability and harmony. So to what extent are different elements of whose reform programs merely talk and merely rhetoric, and to what extent are they sincere? Uh, two ways to address that. <clears throat> One of which sort of recapitulates what I said before. He talks a pretty good game, but as I just suggested, there has been regression and backtracking over the, over the last five to seven years under Hu Jintao, okay? And the backtracking is towards more repression. So in, in that sense, re reform has, to some extent, stalled, especially if we're talking about any kind of political reform.
Yeah, I mean, recently he made a speech in which basically said, look, you know, we're, we're, we're not really, he, he was queuing the, the, the people at the very upper echelons of the party, we're, we're not going to have democracy, not, not in any Western variant. Okay, that's, that's, that's one way to answer it. Another way to answer it is, um, it's true that some of the reforms he's introduced have been quite progressive and attractive. For example, they abolished this thousand-year-old agricultural tax. I don't know if you're aware of this. Recently, okay. Well, yeah, they abolished it, but two things about abolishing it. Number one, uh, in some ways, it was concession to about 20 to 30 years of tax refusal protests in the countryside. <laughs> you know, people said, we're not going to pay these taxes anymore, right? And they had running battles in the, in, in the villages and the counties over the time. So, I mean, you're abolishing something that you had all but lost control of. All right, that's, that's one thing. Um, and, and, and then uh, along with that, um, it's, it's just the case uh, that uh, some, of, some of what he is, has proposed uh, has, has really not uh, been implemented in any way uh, that is to the favor of rural people, and his government has done nothing to correct that. I, I could go into this, whether it's on land policy or especially you now they have a, something called a new socialist countryside in which they're going to reorder and clean up the countryside and uh, attack uh, all kinds of uh, old cultural practices and superstitions, including the cultural practice of uh, having in-ground uh, burial mounds in the countryside uh, so they can have more farmland and they want people to cr cremate uh, their, uh, their dead kin rather than uh, and bury them in the countryside, and and, and these these policies have been distorted and corrupted, uh, you know, locally uh, by officials and police agents who enforce them, and and, and the center has done very little uh, to correct that. So the verdict is still out on Putin Tao. Uh, one one other way to answer this, though, is I'm going to do an about face on you now. When we've interviewed people in the countryside. Uh, the one thing that, you know, and who knows what this really means in, in reality, when, you know, when push comes to shoving you, shove you have a real life situation, uh, if you were to get, you know, a lot of mini rebellions feeding into a larger rebellion and people joining. Uh, but people have said that, you know, they'll have a lot of faith in him and more than they've had in the, the past train of leaders, especially the people who came after Deng Xiaoping who were very corrupt, the, the top leaders. Um, and whereas they, uh, they don't look favorable on the party uh, as a whole or as an institution, uh, Hu Jintao had some measure of, of uh, some high measure of credibility with rural people up until about, I would say, 205, 06. Well, on that note, um, I thought this was um, terrifically stimulating, really a, a great talk, and please join me in thanking Professor Ralph Baxter. Thank you.